Good evening. If you've got your Bible with you, be opening up to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, that is where in a few moments we'll start our study together and have a reading there, Matthew chapter 26, but we're going to take a little time uh, to introduce our topic this evening, but you can be turning over to Matthew chapter 26. Thank you for being here this evening. We have visitors in our audience. We are thankful that you're here. If this is your first time here or first time in a long time, you've got a visitor's card, that yellow card on the back of the pew in front of you. If you wouldn't mind filling that in and dropping that in the collection plate when it comes around, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. But thank you for being here. You are our honored guest. We have several in our congregation that we need to be praying for, those who are sick and recovering, and of course those who are traveling, uh, getting in that last trip before school starts. We want to be prayerful for them as they head back this way. You ever felt like this before? Uh, like you've got two different, almost minds, just fighting against each other. Uh, maybe it's that you know one thing is right, but you don't want to do it. And then there's the ever-present battle of, I should do it, but I don't want to. Or maybe it's something that we know we shouldn't do. We really want to do it. And we walk that line and we fight that fight within ourselves. What do I do? Should I do what I know is wrong? Should I avoid doing what I know is right? That is not something that is unique to us as Christians. In fact, if you do some research into sociology and communications, they have a term for that, $5 term, cognitive dissonance. Uh, while that is a term that floats around different fields of academic study, I think this is a concept that is much more familiar to us as Christians than what we might think just by seeing that phrase in front of us, cognitive dissonance. In fact, it's a feeling that we can see numerous people in Scripture struggling with. And some coming through it positively, some coming through it negatively. But a host of godly people struggling with what academics today would identify as cognitive dissonance. I want us for the few moments we have tonight to, to talk about this concept in light of Scripture and to see how it impacts us today and see if we are struggling with this, how it is that we can handle it, how it is that we can overcome some of this dissonance, and how that we can find a steadier place. I think it's a good follow-up to what we talked about this morning. When we talk about the blessed life, when we talk about living a good life, when we talk about the kind of life that God wants us to live, I look out in this audience, I think most all of us, have a pretty good grasp of what God wants us to do, the kind of life that God wants us to live. But knowing what God wants us to do and then actually doing what God wants us to do are oftentimes two very different things. And, and you only know the private struggles you deal with. I know the private struggles that I deal with. But it's a challenge sometimes to go to bed at night and put your head on your pillow and try to get a calm night's rest. When we pillow our heads and we start thinking back over the day. And this dissonance springs up. What I did versus what I should have done. Let's see if we can get a firmer definition of, of what we mean by this idea of cognitive dissonance. A person by the name of Zon Valines uh, said this in a peer-reviewed article. I think it's a, a pretty good starting point for identifying this concept. Cognitive dissonance occurs when a person holds two related but contradictory cognitions or thoughts. Cognitive dissonance is the discomfort a person feels when their behavior does not align with their values or beliefs. I have a value or a belief that I hold to, but the behavior in which I am engaging betrays that claim, betrays that belief. Let me give you two perfect examples, all right? Example number one, there was a time in our society where folks did not know that smoking cigarettes was bad for you. 
In fact, there was a time when actually some doctors encouraged people to smoke, thinking it had some sort of health benefit for them. Uh, Today, we we see time and time again legislation coming forward about the warnings cigarette manufacturers are having to put on their packets of cigarettes, right? Uh, Not just simply this, uh, this item contains carcinogenic materials, but oftentimes just more blunt than that, smoke and you will lose teeth. Uh, smoke and you will eventually die, things like that. Anyone who, who is able to reason properly knows what about smoking cigarettes? It's bad for you. But what a whole lot of people still do. They still smoke. That is cognitive dissonance. I'm sitting here smoking, doing something that I know is bad, that I know is harmful, that I know eventually stands a good chance of killing me, but what? I like it. It it makes me feel good. It's a habit. This is what I've always done. You know, justify it however we might want to. But I understand that this is deadly. I understand that this is dangerous, but I am still engaging in it. That is cognitive dissonance at its finest. Knowing smoking is bad for me, but continuing to do it anyway. Or how about this? I know I'm going to upset some people here, but don't write me off yet. Somebody says, I love animals. But I love eating bacon too. For some people, not for, not for all of us, but for some people, that can be a form of cognitive dissonance. I love animals. I defend animals' rights. Animals are are basically like humans, somebody might say. But man, a bacon double cheeseburger is good. Cognitive dissonance. Can I continue to eat it whilst proclaiming to be an animal lover? Now, you can sort that one out on your own. But the point stands, right? That is an example of cognitive dissonance, being an animal lover, but being conflicted about how delicious meat tastes and whether or not I am to continue partaking in it. Two examples, but it gets the point across about cognitive dissonance. When we hold a value or a belief that then comes in conflict with deliberate actions that we take, that is cognitive dissonance. And this is not just an exercise in academia. These are real issues and real issues that are even encountered in Scripture. You're there with me in Matthew chapter 26. I want you to come over here with me towards the end of the chapter. Matthew 26 and verse 69. Matteo capitulo 26, verso 69. I think that's right. Matthew 26 and verse 69. And Matthew reads this way. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. And said, you too were with Jesus the Galilean. Of course, filling in the rest of the story here, Jesus is, he has already been arrested at the garden. He is going through his trials. Here is Peter who has been following things off at a distance, uh, warming himself beside the fire now. And here come the accusations. You, You know this man. And in verse 70, he denied it before them all, Peter did, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, saying, I do not know the man. And a little later the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for even the way that you talk gives you away. And then Peter began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. A rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said before. A rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Cognitive dissonance at its finest. Remember what Peter had said earlier in Scripture? Go back to, go back to chapter 26 and verse 33. 20 verses or so prior. Better so trent the trace, Matthew 26 and verse 33. 
Jesus has instituted the Lord's Supper. Uh, this bread is my body. This drink is my cup. Or my blood, which is given for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus, in verse 31, tells them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, verse 32, implying that he is going to die, after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter said what to him? Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. You say we're all going to desert you, Jesus. I won't do it. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all of the other disciples said the same thing. Peter has said what? I'm not going to deny you. I'm going to stand with you, Jesus. We have come this far and I'm not leaving you. But then the mob comes. The mob comes and Jesus is arrested. Peter picks up a sword, cuts off a guy's ear. Wasn't aiming for his ear, obviously. He's aiming for his head, isn't he? Peter was ready to go down swinging literally. Jesus is taken away into trial. The disciples flee. Peter wanders back close to the scene. Follows the goings-on here at a distance. And then sitting out in the courtyard, here comes servant girl number one. I saw you with him. No, you didn't. Number two, you were with him. No, I wasn't. Person number three, yes, you were. You were one of them. The way that you talk, being a Galilean gives it away. I don't know the man. And the rooster crows. And what sets in? Here's cognitive dissonance. Here's what I know I should have been. And what I am. What I know I should have done. And what I have been doing. And what was the response? How, how, did, how did this cognitive dissonance settle into Peter? Peter. He started to weep. He started to weep because this set in that, that what he said he was going to do and what he claimed to be and what he knew he should be and what he knew he should be doing fell in the face of the hardship that came before him. Of course, thankfully, that's not the end of the story. And, and if this story encourages us in, us in any way, it encourages us to this end. We can face cognitive dissonance, we can fall in the face of cognitive dissonance, but then we can rise again. Come over to chapter 4 in the book of Acts. Hechos, capítulo 4, verso 19, Acts chapter 4, starting over here in verse 19. The first half of the book of Acts, let's say the half, first 40% of the book of Acts, focuses on Peter. We're going to pick up with Paul at the end of the book of Acts, but the beginning of the book of Acts is about Peter. Peter preaching in Acts chapter 2 along with the rest of the apostles. Peter and John preaching in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John preaching in Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, and they're preaching, they've been arrested. They have been hauled before the council. And they have been told, verse 18, you are not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus anymore. And beginning in verse 19, Peter and John answered and said to them this, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go. And when they were released, verse 23, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said. And when they heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and they praised God. And then what happened? 
Peter goes back to doing what? Teaching and preaching and encouraging people in the name of Jesus. They had said, don't do it anymore. Peter said, tough. This is who I am. This is what I must do. We cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Well, they were pulled before the council again. Verse 27, arrested and brought back. And when they had brought them before the council, this is in chapter 5 and verse 27, the high priest questioned them saying, didn't we give you strict instructions not to continue teaching in this name and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter answered and said what? We ought to obey God rather than man. Do you notice a change here in Peter? Peter who back in Matthew's account makes a claim but then runs away from it. Here Peter is making the claim in chapter 4 and then doing what? Standing. He has overcome that challenge that he faced in the past. He failed but now he has overcome. This is repentance. Peter repented of what he had done. He has changed. He's doing better now. Come over here to the end of this account. Verse 40. The council took the advice of Gamaliel. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. One of the apostles, of course, is Peter. Here is Peter now actually getting beaten being whipped for what he believed, for what he was doing, for what he was teaching. And they told them again, do not speak in the name of Jesus, do not teach in the name of Jesus. And at the end of verse 40, they released them. And so in verse 41, Peter went on his way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that he had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, he kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Cognitive dissonance set in. He failed in Matthew 26. He says never again. He repents. He changes. Here's the opportunity again. And this time godliness wins out, doesn't it? He says, I have made this claim. This is who I am. And this is where I'm going to stand. I'm not going to fail like I did last time. I learned my lesson. This is what God has called me to be. This is who God has called me to be. And this is who I am going to be. Peter repented, Peter changed, and Peter succeeded. Contrast that with another example of dissonance we see in the New Testament. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And it's the story of Judas, another one of the apostles. In Matthew chapter 27... After this has transpired with Peter, the rooster has crowed, Peter has heard it, he's gone out and wept bitterly. We transition, at least Matthew transitions, to put the spotlight on another person who's suffering with cognitive dissonance. Spotlight shifts from Peter to Judas. Now when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned to the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders. Did you catch that there in verse 1? When does this happen? When morning came. We don't know exactly how long he had to think about it. But any degree of time to think about what Judas had done would be too much, wouldn't it? That's sitting heavy on his heart. He has betrayed Jesus. And now Jesus is going to die. And Judas stands guilty. He's played a role in this. Why would he do this? Hold your finger there in Matthew 27. I want you to jump forward in our Bibles, but backwards in time, to John chapter 6. Juan capítulo 6. John chapter 6. Y verso 71. John chapter 6 and verse 71. In verse 70, 
Jesus identifies to his disciples that one of them is going to betray him. And in verse 71, John records for us, he was speaking of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. But why? There's a context here to this statement. Why was, why was Judas going to betray Jesus? Go back to verse 60. Go back to verse 60 in chapter 6. In, in Jesus' great sermon here in Matthew chapter 6, at the conclusion of it, at the conclusion of this synagogue sermon, in verse 60, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can understand it? And in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples turned away and walked with him no more. Something that Jesus said in the midst of chapter 6 turned a whole lot of people off of him. People who earlier in chapter 6, I think it's around verses 15 or 16, people who were ready to take Jesus and force him to be their king. Now in the span of a day, have decided they want nothing to do with him. They turn around and they walk with him no more. And one of them is eager to betray him, Judas. What happened? Go back to verse 51. I think this is the impetus for Judas' betrayal. In this great sermon, Jesus says in verse 51, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is what? My flesh. The Jewish audience understood very well the, the prohibitions in the law of Moses against cannibalism and against drinking blood. That's not what Jesus is describing here. Verse 51 makes it clear, clear to the Jewish audience, and if we can put ourselves in a Jewish mindset, clear enough to us as well. Jesus isn't telling them to engage in cannibalism. Jesus isn't even talking about the Lord's Supper here. Jesus in verse 51 is talking about his death. He would give himself, he would die as a sacrifice so that the world might have life. And to a group of people who were ready in that moment to take Jesus and make him their king, force him to be their king, that was a bridge too far. How can he be our king, the reasoning goes, if he's dead? How can he drive out the Romans? This was their thinking. How can he drive out the Romans? How can he restore our nation to prominence? How can he give us deliverance from those who rule and terrorize us if he's dead? But Jesus knows he's going to die. He knows that's why he has come. Reading verses 51 and 60 and 71 together, we get a picture. Add in the fact that Judas is called Judas Iscariot. That's not a last name. That's an indication of where he was from. Elsewhere in the New Testament, he's called the Canaanian. Uh, he was from a place that was noted for its rebellion against Rome, which makes it all the more interesting that both Judas and Matthew, the tax collector for Rome, were serving together in Jesus' band of twelve. But here is a man who wanted with all of his heart to see Rome overthrown and the nation of Israel restored to prominence. And perhaps it is Judas sees Jesus as the ticket to that happening. But now Jesus says, what? My mission is not to drive out the Romans. My mission is to what? To die. Can you imagine then the cognitive dissonance that Judas feels? His worldview has been shattered. What do I do then with this man that I have been following, that I've placed my trust and my life with, but who now tells me the very thing for which I have been seeking is not going to happen? Or then put yourself in the shoes of Judas after all of this happens. Come back with me to Matthew 27. Matteo capitulo 26, verso 4. 
Matthew 27 and verse 4. See the, the dissonance that Judas struggles with here. As he has betrayed the Savior and then he has a night to think about it. Can you imagine the sleeplessness that would have poured over him in waves? Have you ever felt like that before, that, that, that you're so tired, something's weighing heavily on your mind, and you finally think you might be drifting to sleep, and then all of a sudden, bang, it comes wave after wave, and what you've done and what you've thought about just comes pouring back on you. But imagine what's coming pouring back on you is the fact that you betrayed the Son of God. Here's Judas. So give him credit, verse 3, he felt what? Felt remorse. He's sorry for what he's done. And he returns the 30 pieces of silver, saying, verse 4, I have betrayed innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed. And he went away and he hanged himself. Here's the, here's the contrast to Peter, isn't it? Here's where cognitive dissonance won out. He doesn't find within himself the repentance that Peter found. He deems his sin too much. Perhaps he deems God's grace not enough. And he goes out and he kills himself, hangs himself. They don't even take the money and put it in the temple treasury. They say they can't do it. Now we've got scruples, right? But you see the, the dissonance that Judas struggles with here? One other one. We, we referenced this very briefly this morning. We didn't spend a lot of time on it, but remember David's sin with Bathsheba there in 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel chapter 11? We won't read that story just for the sake of, of time this evening. But David should be out with his troops. He's not out fighting with his troops. He's back at his palace. Uh, he goes out one night. He sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof. We often say the sin was not in that he saw. The sin is that he looked twice. He decides to call Bathsheba to himself. He commits adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, he lies. He gets Uriah drunk. He eventually kills Uriah. And then he takes Bathsheba for his own wife. 2 Samuel chapter 12 records the story of Nathan, the prophet, coming to David sometime later, within a span of weeks or months, not days it doesn't seem like. And he talks to David, he tells him this story right about a rich man with his flocks and the poor man with his one ewe lamb. And a traveler comes in and hospitality is expected to be shown. And the rich man, instead of going to his flocks, goes to the poor man and says what? Give me... Your ewe lamb that's like a child to you. David's righteous indignation is flared. The man who has done this should be put to death, but not before he's going to restore to this man uh, whatever he took from him. And, and the poor man, he needs to be taken care of. And then Nathan the prophet says, What? You're the man. You're the man, David. Ooh, cognitive dissonance, right? Can you imagine it in that moment? You ever had a moment like that before? His world is spinning. He's going through a range of emotions. You ever had that feeling where you can literally feel your temperature getting higher and like the redness creeping up from your neck all the way to the top of your head? Do you think that's what he's feeling? what he should have been doing, what he should have done, how he should have been versus what he did. And of course, to his credit, what's going to happen? David owns it. 
Verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. There's more to that story, but that's the point. But here's where I want you to go with me. Come with me to Psalm 32, where we were just a little bit this morning. Psalm 32. Psalm 32. And I want you to to hear David talk about his struggle with dissonance here. His personal struggle, he fought with cognitive dissonance. First four verses. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. But verse 3, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. No energy. Heartbroken. A heavy conscience. A body wasting away. No rest. No recovery. That's David struggling with what he did versus what he knew he should have done and what he should be doing now. That's cognitive distance. We see this all throughout Scripture, don't we? It's not some new idea. It's not some new concept. It's something that we see all throughout Scripture. Now, here's what I want you to think about with me for a few moments. How, how might we face dissonance today? And, and before we, we start talking about that, I, I want you to think how sometimes we deal with cognitive dissonance. That we face this from time to time in our lives, but sometimes we employ some strategies to kind of push this down. Right, the the New Testament talks about our conscience as being seared, as with a hot iron, right? That our conscience might be indicating to us, hey, what you've done is wrong, that we have a a conscience trained in godliness, and, and now we understand, hey, I shouldn't be doing this. But when that little voice starts chirping, Tyler, you shouldn't be doing this, sometimes what we do is what? Shut up. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to hear that. Don't have time for it. Sometimes we respond to cognitive dissonance by by avoiding it or ignoring it. We actively attempt not to think about it. Hey, do me a favor right now. Do not think of a purple elephant. And what did you just do? You thought about a purple elephant. How well does that ever work out for us? Just don't think about it. How does that work? Our kids come to us at night and say, hey, there's a monster in my closet, there's a monster in my bed. Well, well, go back to bed and just don't think about it. That is a recipe for what? Knock on the door five minutes later, it's still there. Right? Ignoring it, avoiding it, that doesn't work. Or sometimes what we avoid are the people or the situations that remind us of the dissonance that we're struggling with. You see, here's what happens with this sometimes. If it's in the congregation of the righteous that I start to be reminded of where I have failed and where I am failing and where I need to change, my answer then is just what? Don't go be with the righteous. Surely we recognize what an awful decision that is. That's cutting ourselves off from the very source of strength that God provides for us in real time. We attempt to avoid or ignore dissonance. Sometimes we delegitimize the dissonance. We discredit the circumstance that brings about the dissonance. The doctor says don't smoke. Well, what does he know? The doctor says, don't eat at Chick-fil-A anymore. Find another doctor. (laughs) Right? Things like that. Or in more serious terms, we delegitimize the dissonance. If the Bible says homosexual activity is wrong, well, what? Well, the Bible's wrong. God's wrong. The translators got it wrong. The church is wrong. The church's interpretation is wrong. We try to 
delegitimize instead of actually dealing with the issue. Or we try to limit the impact. We limit the impact of the dissonance. We convince ourselves that the issue is not really that important. Or we reassure ourselves that the issue is only momentary. Hey, it's just once. It's not like this is a lifestyle for me. I'm just going to do it this once. It's not that big of a deal. No, not that many people are around. Not anybody's going to know about it. It's no big deal. And we say that to ourselves. But then what does that do? That makes the next time what? That much easier. We try to minimize the dissonance today using these strategies, and none of these strategies are helpful, are they? They prolong the suffering. They hide the, the, the real source of what we're dealing with. Think about some ways we might experience dissonance today. When I try to serve God in wealth, what does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. You cannot do what? You cannot serve God and wealth. And yet, what do we try to do from time to time? Oh, we try to walk that line, and we try to walk that line as fine as we can, don't we? And hey, the, the reality is some, sometimes our, our, our concern, our worry about wealth may, may start innocently enough. When Jesus makes that statement uh, about not serving God and wealth, there's going to be in a context there in Matthew chapter 6 where he talks about focusing upon God and having faith in God that God is going to provide for us. Hey, there might be a time when I, when I am suffering, when I'm going through extreme hardship, and I might not be, know where my next meal might be coming from or where I'm going to find clothes to wear, where I'm going to find a place to sleep at night. And in those circumstances, God says, I've got you. I'm going to take care of it. You just focus on serving me, and I'm going to take care of you. But if we focus too much on the one and not on the other, do we start to grow and grow and grow in our concern about wealth and what starts off innocently enough snowballs into something that we don't even recognize at the end that has completely overwhelmed us? Jesus cautions us against that. Having food and clothing let us be satisfied. Sometimes this dissonance strikes us and we're trying to serve God, but then we find ourselves doing all sorts of things in our jobs, in our professional lives, maybe even as high school kids getting a job. We're getting a job that takes us away from our brethren. We're getting a job that takes us away from our assemblies, and that's not just our high school kids, that's any of us. And look, I understand sometimes we have to work and it causes us away. That's not what I'm talking about. But when we're choosing occupations, when we're choosing jobs, when we're choosing to engage in activities which actively and consistently and persistently pull us away from God and His people and what God expects us to be, we can't fool ourselves and think we're not going to experience this dissonance. Knowing what we should be and then how we're living currently. Or think about this. When my leisure doesn't conform to godliness, here's a moment when dissonance really sets in. When my leisure doesn't conform to godliness. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 introduces this kind of concept to us. Right? There's nothing wrong with recreational activities. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Bodily exercise profits... Only a little. But godliness is profitable for all things since it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life that is to come. There's nothing wrong with, with choosing recreation and leisure, but whatever things I choose to uh, swallow up my, my leisure time, whatever things I, I choose to engage in and recreation-wise, the Holy Spirit says here, needs to reflect godliness. But what happens when it doesn't? This happens. And I find myself realizing, here's what I should be. But here's what I'm doing. And that conflict rages within me. And sometimes I try to avoid it. Sometimes I try to delegitimize it. Sometimes I try to limit its impact. But how well do those strategies ever work out? Let me give you two practical examples here. I had a friend, and we'll call her Ashley. It's not important. You know who she is. She was a cheerleader. 
And then she became a Christian. She was the only one in her family who became a Christian. She saw some members of the church that would leave every Sunday and go to church. She wondered why her family never did that. She finally asked, hey, could I get a ride? I want to go to church too. They did. Years down the road, Ashley becomes a Christian. She was a cheerleader. And as she grew in Christ, here's what she came to realize. She came to realize that the uniform they were wearing at that school, not every school I get that, but the uniform that they were wearing at that school, and I went to school with her, didn't reflect Christ-likeness. It was what we would call today immodest. Didn't reflect Christ-likeness. And beyond that, she recognized the movements that she was engaging in as part of the cheer squad certainly didn't display Christ-likeness. Those movements were more along the lines of what you read in Galatians about being sensual and licentious and things like that. And so for a time, this battle waged within her. I'm supposed to be this, but this is how I'm living, and here's this conflict raging within me, and what do I do? And you know what she finally did? She turned in the cheerleading skirt. She said, I can't do this anymore. And you know what she found when she did that? Peace. And you know what she's doing today? She's being a godly mom today. That what she gave up didn't destroy her life. Didn't cause her to balloon to 500 pounds and eating bonbons and drinking RC Cola and watching reruns on the TV. She's happy. She's content. She's at peace. And she was at peace when she made that decision the very night she made it. Let me tell you another story about a guy I know named Robbie, we'll call him. Robbie got into alcohol at a young age. And Robbie got heavily into alcohol. He used alcohol as a masking agent. You don't feel good, drink. You lonely, drink. You need company, drink. Days gone well, drink. Days gone bad, drink. Days just a day that ends in Y. Hey, have a drink. That catches up to you. Robbie recognized it was wrong and recognized it was wrong the first time he did it, but for a variety of reasons, Robbie didn't want to stop. You know what he tried to do? Tried to avoid it. Tried to pretend it wasn't that serious. Tried to delegitimize it. Tried to tell himself that it wasn't as bad as everyone else was making it out to be. That he had it all together. He tried to convince himself that he was handling everything well. He tried to convince himself that he was in control. You know the rest of the story, don't you? He wasn't. Multiple times his life was nearly ruined. Stints in jail, car wrecks, hospitalizations, blowing through nearly a million dollars by the time he was 30. That's what he realizes now. And the dissonance caught up to him. Dissonance is why he started, struggled with dissonance as he continued. The drinking didn't make the dissonance go away, it just added a layer of complexity to it. A layer of complexity that, thank God, he's been delivered from now. He's overcome that. It's in his past as much as any addicting behavior can be in one's past. But that was his leisure. That was his recreation. It was drinking. It was doing drugs. That was how he tried to quiet the voices and calm the dissonance. And it didn't work. It didn't work because the way that he chose to recreate himself, the leisure he chose, didn't conform to godliness. One last one. We face dissonance today when when my life doesn't look like Jesus is in control. You want to know how to, how to make a miserable Christian? You want to know how to be miserable as a Christian? Just don't give Jesus your life. 
Just don't give Jesus your life. And then struggle daily with the weight of the reality that I know what I need to do. I just don't want to do it. Or I'm just not going to do it. And then tell me, like we talked about this morning, how much of a blessed life you're going to have, how much peace you're going to have, how much stability you're going to have. Tell me how well you're going to sleep at night. And the answer is what? You're not unless you're going to avoid it, delegitimize it, or limit its impact. And then that's, not, that's going to stop working after a while too. Now I'm not saying everything that we deal with in this life is because of this. Let's be clear about that. I'm not saying that every difficulty we ever face is because of this. It's not. But I am saying this happens to Christians more often than we care to admit. And sometimes the key to overcoming something is being able to see it for what it is. So how do we overcome dissonance today? We're quitting, don't worry. This is the last slide. We'll throw it up real quick. How, how do we resolve this? Four, four steps. Number one, we've got to accept God's word as truth. We've got to accept Jesus as being the truth, and we've got to accept God's word as being truth. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said what? High school class. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That's one of our memory verses. They've all got it. We've got to accept God's word as truth. It's what Jesus said, John 17, 17, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word, O God, is truth. Cognitive dissonance does not get resolved into our li- in our lives until we recognize and affirm God's word is truth. Next, we've got to take truth into the very core of who we are. Psalm 51 is written about the same time as Psalm 32. Same instance in David's life. And he says what about God? What does God want from us? Behold, you desire truth in the inner parts. Here's how we overcome cognitive dissonance. We take that truth and we put it right here. We put it in our hearts. We make God's word, God's truth, a part of who we are. We surrender our lives fully to Jesus. Galatians 2 and verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. I give my life over to Jesus. And then I rest in the reality that no matter what I have done in the past, I can still be today what God wants me to be. Ephesians 4 and verse 1, I can walk worthy of the calling with which I have been called. Or what John would say in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, we don't have to sin. Brethren, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. I can be what God wants me to be. There's a place God has for me. But it comes from taking his word as truth and putting it into my life and surrendering my life over to Jesus. If you haven't done that tonight, you've got an opportunity to do that. If as a Christian you haven't been living as you should and you need to make a change, we want you to make that change and we want to help you make that change. If this dissonance is what you're facing in your life, we want to help you overcome that. And we believe in the power of God through his word to help us overcome that. Maybe you've never come to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never put him onto the waters of baptism and raised to walk a new life. If you haven't done that, you have a chance to do that this evening. If we can help you respond to the gospel in any way, would you come while we stand and while we sing?